the Hughes Center for Agroecology and the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science for, and the Planning Committee for putting on today's event. So thank you all very much. Um, so I, I mentioned to Nancy Nunn this morning that this, I couldn't imagine a more delightful panel to get to introduce. Um, we have Kim Koble, who's the Vice President of Environmental Protection and Restoration for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. Bill Dennison, who is the Vice President for Science Applications at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science and Julie Pipple, who is the Director of the Division of Environmental Management for Washington County. So this panel is about focusing on next steps, and you heard a lot of ideas and flashes of brilliance today, right? So they're gonna share with us some of their thoughts about the best ideas they heard today that they think will carry us forward into the future. We're hoping that this will be also some discussion with you all. So they're gonna start off by sharing with us just very quickly for five minutes each, some of their thoughts and wisdom. Good afternoon. So as counties, can you, so as counties move forward, we will need to focus on BMP availability to accomplish our restoration goals and continue reviewing ideas like the, those that were shared with us today. We will need as many tools as possible in our toolboxes to continue to refine and expand these tools in order to accomplish our goals. Variety and diversity of the BMPs is a key to the counties to be able to plan, work what, to plan what works best for their individual situations and they need to cover all the sectors. We'll have to review the existing practices and determine if they have changed their effectiveness and what impact that has had on the county's existing plans, both in a positive and negative form. We'll have to continually review the new BMPs and determine if they work for our individual situations and our geography across the state. We need to look at taking a broader approach in the BMP use meaning looking at all sectors as potential sources and not silo the sectors within our counties to increase the effectiveness of our work. As Lee Curley mentioned earlier, greener options result in broader value. Flexibility is going to be a key. We need to do outside the box thinking. We need to have open mind, think, open mind thinking and review of new opportunities that come forth, such as some some of the ideas brought today. Nutrient trading between the sectors is going to be a key for us to achieve these goals in a cost-efficient and effective manner. Certainty of the BMP options is going to be critical for us in developing and our reviewing our 2017 plans. We need to know that what we use in our plans is not going to be changing. We understand this is an ever-changing process and dynamic as we move forward towards 2025. However, there is frustration when we place these BMPs into our plans and we find out their effectiveness has changed and it results in our strategies and plans not achieving the goals, causing delays and increasing the costs. The recent decision by the Maryland Court of Appeals where they announced the ruling on the MS4 permit litigation upheld the MDMS, MDMS4 permits. This is really favorable decision for local governments, going back to providing us the idea of flexibility. It provides us options for the local governments, especially when unknown conditions occur during the implementation of these plans and projects. Some of the challenges and questions the county still have moving forward the MS4 permits are challenging to meet, and meeting the permit reductions will be expensive and strain or exceed county capacity personnel funding. So we need to continue working on ideas brought up from our finance, um, environmental financing group. Nutrient credits, while this is a helpful and very much needed tool, 
we need to understand what is the true capacity availability for trading uh, from all the sectors. Financing. We appreciate that the BRF funds will continue to support or continue to provide money towards stormwater practices. The question is, what is the capacity of this funding versus the need of the stormwater sector? Also, we need to look at the regional issues which impact the 2017 milestone loading allocations, not only regional but also local. So for example, on a regional level, we discuss the Conowingo Dam this morning, its impact and how to, how to address it, its restoration needs. On a local level, we need to be prepared to address challenges that come up on a specific project level and find their existing, when we find their existing conditions and public requirements such as utilities or fire lanes, those contradicting um, requirements for society prevent us from completing what is actually planned. Um, in closing, the state and county has been recognized as leaders in the TMDL efforts. In order for this to continue and for everyone to be successful, we need to continue to take a team approach. We express gratitude for Secretary Grumbles and his staff for recognizing this key factor and look forward to continuing this approach. Also, legislation, excuse me, legislation is not always a benefit and can lead to enforcement consent agreements, which only delay and increase the costs associated with accomplishing this work on the county level. So as we move forward, we feel that continuing discussions and ideal sharing as we did today is an important part as we take our next steps forward. Okay, uh, well here we are talking about accelerating bay restoration and Sarah, thanks for working with Town Creek and putting this great uh, thing on. We had a great venue, we had a great lunch. Uh, this morning we talked about John Smith, Pocahontas, and notice uh, there's John and Pocahontas and Don, Don Bosch was at, the, at, the, at the, the moment there. And Don talked about, you know, when he, he you know, he, here he is getting ready for the, the event, but when he dies he wants his ashes to be spread and doesn't want it to go into the dead zone. So, so that's the marker we have to work toward. Uh, and Don said something very important about the transition from low-hanging fruit to the tough nuts, and we're, we're all about the tough nuts here. Ben Grumbles uh, decided to put himself in the middle of this trading world and try to figure out how to accelerate bay restoration through effective market forces. Uh, ben also is trying to hold back the water from the Susquehanna coming over the Conowingo <laughs> as much as possible. Uh, and Ben had a great quote from Pogo, we are confronted with insurmountable opportunities. Rich Batuk came along and talked about this, this miner in the coal mine with the canary, and the canary being the dead zone. So, so this, is, this is a good measure. We, we, we can see if we can shrink that dead zone. Lee Curry talked about how we shrink the dead zone through implementation of reduction of nutrient sources like point sources and non-point sources. If you notice when Lee was asked any questions, he, he, he became the president of the Department of Passing the Buck. He <laughs> passed it off every time he could. Stuart Schwartz talked about leaky landscapes, in particular the uh, what's green isn't always good on the surface, that you need the brown underneath to percolate and get the water to go away. Dan talked about uh, being an NPR lover, but we had to reach beyond that, so he went to the churches and the schools in PG County, which I think is a really important thing that we often talk to each other. It's good to, to move beyond. Uh, Sadie uh, Drescher talked about laying awake at night, worrying about bay restoration progress, and I think the solution is to think green. I think that's what will get you to sleep. Dan talked about uh, uh, for 
um, for the Pretty Boy Reservoir Watershed talked about eco-smart initiatives like taking turf to trees, stop mowing the lawn, and, and some great ideas along those lines. Ward Slakem and his colleagues at the o Oyster Recovery Partnership have this vision of a restored oyster reef bay with all these important positive feedbacks. And I think that's a theme that we see throughout is these, if we get the right trajectories going, we get positive feedbacks happening. Stephanie came up here and talked about chicken manure, turning it into biogas. She also talked about sustainability initiatives with, with big companies like Walmart. So there's some real uh, synergies that you can create there. Rebecca Fox t uh, talked about the chop tank watershed and then a whole slew of, of interesting agricultural uh, practices like ditches and bioreactors, cover crops, precision ag, all these things that farmers are experimenting with to do better for nitrogen phosphorus sediments and ultimately soil type and crop yield. Judy Denver took a look underneath the ground and talked about groundwater and, and flows uh, on Delmarva and cover crops and irrigation trends that are gonna change this, this map of nutrient flow through the groundwater. Dan, of course, just entertained us uh, with um, this, this great quote, a restoration success is achievable with major league caveats. So, so I think that's a, and that was sort of a theme we heard from the beginning and that kind of bookended it because that's what uh, Don and Ben talked about. We can do this. Uh, we just have to work a little harder. In my last slide, and this is the last slide of the day, we got great views. So what I propose is we open up these, uh, th these curtains for our final uh, talk, uh, Kim, Co Kim Coble, and then our panel discussion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, thank you, Bill. I hate following you. Um, I'm not even sure how to start. Um, so, probably in two minutes, actually, I, I want to tell you the three uh, take-homes that came to me today. The th what, what matters based on what we heard today? And um, there's three things that matter, according to Kim Coble. Yeah, write it down, Jenny. <laughs> Local work matters. We heard some very inspiring and effective stories at the local level. We heard about work in the Pretty Boy Watershed, Prince George's County's doing fabulous work, Anne Arundel County. We, we heard about work at schools and even at churches uh, in the Chop Tank River. And that, that matters, that all that little work matters. It may feel that a rain garden or a rain barrel Really, is that gonna move the needle? It all adds up. And I don't think we can diminish the, the magnitude of that work when we start putting it together, both from a nutrient uh, reduction standpoint, but also from a, um, uh, creating the, 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 the concept of success and that we can do this. I think that that attitude carries and it's pervasive. So wo local work matters. The other thing is smarter work matters. And this is where we learned about the importance of targeting our work. Uh, Dan spoke very eloquently about the need for efficiencies with our dollars. For every dollar, let's maximize the pollution reduction that we're getting from that. That's critical. In this day and age, in 2016, given the work that's ahead of us, we no longer have the luxury of tossing money around. Not that we ever really tossed it, but uh, in, in terms of smarter work matters, how we're, we're going to give credits. These need to be verifiable and accurate so that the reductions that are happening are meaningful and right and also fair to those people that are putting them in the ground. We want to get those right. Offsets, trading, we cannot lose ground. It's daunting to look at the increasing population growth and everything that comes with it, uh, climate change and everything that comes with it. So we need to make sure that those trading and offset programs are in place so we can counter it and innovation. Uh, we heard some really good examples of smart innovation, whether it's the public-private pr 
public-private partnership or the digesters or whatever it is, those um, innovations are smarter. Local work matters, smarter work matters. And then the last thing that struck me about today is that tenacity matters. You know, just the hard work that's ahead, it is not easy, and unfortunately, it is not gonna happen quickly. Uh, you know, we heard from Judy about the long t lifespan of groundwater and how it's gonna take a long, long time before we're gonna see the changes. Um, Rich Batuk was really positive about the changes we are seeing. I think we need to celebrate those. That's part of being tenacious. It's to look at what you can s celebrate and be positive about and stay diligent about the other parts. The science is evolving. While we're the most studied ecosystem in the world, our science is evolving, and we have to be patient about that. Um, the the, the um, BMP effectiveness, the soil health, precision ag, all those things are evolving. And lastly, I think being tenacious is also holding ourselves accountable. Uh, we, we need to make sure that progress continues, that the politics line up, the funding lines up, the attitudes line up, and then we can celebrate the progress. So local work, smarter work, and tenacity all matter. Great, thank you. So just to close this panel out, I just have one final burning question, which is that we heard about some amazing examples happening around this watershed. I'm just wondering if any of the panelists have thoughts about things that might be happening out in the globe, in the world, that we need to be looking at here in the Chesapeake Bay. Any thoughts, Bill? Um, so one of the things, I, I got a chance to spend 10 years in Australia, a very water-starved continent. And so they are very water smart by necessity. So they've had to figure out how to be water smart. We're gonna to have to figure out how to be water smart too. We've had this luxury of bountiful, plentiful water. But as you can see from the irrigation increases and climate impacts and increasing demand, we're not gonna be as blessed about water in the future. So we're gonna to have to figure out how to be water smarter. It turns out by being water smarter, you can be nutrient smarter as well. So I think water smart communities are gonna be something that we can emulate from other parts of the world that have had to do this uh, by necessity earlier. Secondly, uh, I think that we're still a little slow to catch on to the integration of the social, economic, and environmental, that, that integration. I think a lot of places are, are, are moving along those lines a lot uh, more rapidly. And I look at it in terms of innovation. When we think innovation, we tend to think of technological, you know, the, the digesters and things that we could do. But they're regulatory innovations, they're social innovations, there are legal innovations, and there are economic innovations. There are lots of ways that we can innovate to create better solutions. And I think we can learn a lot from a lot of other places that have done those experiments in nutrient trading, done the experiments in, and, and, and nutrient taxing, uh, for example. Uh, and, and then finally, uh, one of the things that, that I think that um, we've, we've, we've had for, as Kim alluded, you know, the best studied bay in the world. We, we're not quite to the best managed bay of the world. We're the most managed maybe, but I wouldn't say we're the best. And so there are other management systems that we can still learn from. So the Chesapeake Bay program is still an international example but there are other places that are tackling difficult problems, uh, doing adaptive management that are uh, progressive uh, ways of moving forward. So I think we can learn on, on, on several fronts. I think we can be more water smart. I think we can uh, be more expansive about our innovation across the social, economic, environmental spheres. And I think finally we can, we can learn a lot from other ways to manage these complex, large ecosystems. Um, I think for me, and I don't, this is a dream, <laughs> I don't think this is going to happen for us, but I think we need to learn from Europe on land development. You know, how, uh, how land is developed, and they've been at it a lot longer than we have. Uh, the, the compressed living, the bicycle lanes they have, the way they use water, uh, the way they, their food systems are set up are much more local based. And, you know, if Americans could give up uh, our love of the car, I think we would see a huge improvement in many ways. I think Ben mentioned about mobile sources. Uh, so I, I actually, um, and, and 
I think it was Ben also that said something to the effect of, um, you know, the history of the land is found in the water. And, you know, what we're doing on the land is impacting this more than any other place in the world. Uh, so I think as we develop land, we should take a hard look at how Europe's done it. Kind of switching gears a little bit, um, earlier we had, it was brought up about reaching out to the non-NPR crowd. I think we need to further look at drawing our citizens in and reminding them that while we sit here and we talk about this being a Bay issue, those improvements we make impact their local water qualities first. So for people in Western Maryland who don't necessarily think of the Bay and its importance to the, to the state and the environment, you can draw them in by making them realize and understand doing this gives them that local impact. Um, and learning how we can get those citizens involved um, and maybe more cooperation between local governments and non-government organizations, environmental groups that do get out to the citizens um, and, and get their involvement more. Great, let's have a hand for our panelists. Thank you all. Well, haven't we had a full information packed day of nuggets that we can take with us as we go out and about. I wanted to conclude by again thanking all speakers and especially thanking all of you who came through this entire day. But I want to ask you two questions with a show of hands. The first question is, how many of you did any ice skating when you were a kid? That's quite a lot. The second question is, when you knew that it was your last time that you could get out on the ice with your skates, did you skate really hard and explore all of the area that you could skate in because you knew this was going to be your last? How many of, of you might have? Oh, dear. Well, <laughs> thank you, Dave. <laughs> Well, I sure did. <laughs> well, I sure did. I skated the heck off my ice skates, and I went even where the ice might have been thin and my mother would have just fainted if she had seen me. But I think we're there. I think that's the tactic we need to take. We need to put on those skates, and we need to view this next snippet of time, which it is, and skate our, our ice skates off as hard as we can and explore different tactics, some of which you've heard here today, whether it be a project or a process, we need to explore them to get to where we need to be. And there's lyrics to a song that some of you might remember. This is it. Make no mistake where you are. This is it. It's all of us. It's the Chesapeake Bay. It's our local waters. We cannot make a mistake as to where we are. Because after all, we've got to make sure Don Bosch gets his wish. Thank you all.